annual Aspen Security Forum as well. This is our fourth annual Aspen Security Forum, and this is the closing session of that forum. So thank you all very much for being with us. I want to thank, uh, again, as I did on opening night, our sponsors, Academy, AGT, IBM, Microsoft, Target, Raytheon, and the Robert R. McCormick Foundation. And I want to also thank our media partners, the New York Times and CNN's Security Clearance blog. I couldn't be more pleased to have as our moderator for tonight's final session, my old friend Wolf Blitzer. Wolf needs no introduction. He's a legend, a living legend, <laughs> as we all know. Uh, Wolf is, the, uh, is CNN's lead political anchor and the anchor of the Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer, which of course is must-see TV for policymakers and pundits in Washington and for enlightened viewers all across the country and the world. Wolf has been with CNN for 23 years, covering every major issue there is during the course of their, there was during the course of those 23 years. And uh, I couldn't, be, again, be happier that you're here, Wolf, and thank you very much for leading tonight's thank final you. session. Long way from Kuwait yeah. in 1990. Thank you very much, Clark. Thank you very much to all of you for showing up. Thanks to the Aspen Institute, which I love. I've been coming here to Aspen for way too many years, uh, going back I think I was uh, in the executive program in 1983. Uh, that was a long time ago. Aspen was a little bit different than it is right now, but it's still a great place. Uh, and all of you are blessed and fortunate to be here, at least for a few days. In general, you are blessed to be. Is this your first time here? It is, yes. How do you like it so far? Uh, the free competition of ideas. It's wonderful. Well, what about Aspen? Forget about the competition uh, for ideas. I'm from the West. This is God's country. All right. Uh, he's from the Pacific Northwest in a town called Walla Walla. Walla Walla. You've been to Walla Walla? Uh, I'm from a town in western New York called Buffalo, New York. Or, or, or as we call it, the sun and fun capital of the United States. General uh, Mattis retired uh, just a, recently, June 1st, is that correct? Mm -hmm. U.S. Uh, Marine Corps, uh, and he was the commander of the U.S. military's Central Command, which is really, really important, because the Central Command has within its jurisdiction all the hot spots in the world, you name it. And, and we're going to go through a lot of these hot spots right now, whether it's Syria, uh, whether it's Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Egypt. You got some more, too. You got little countries. But he's got all the bad news, all the tough uh, issues he has to deal with. Uh, and I've, I've worked with him, I've worked with uh, his predecessors. I know how hard it is to, to run an operation like this uh, because you've got to deal, unfortunately, with, with some of the worst things in the world, namely war and death and destruction. Uh, and it's not easy when you're a commander in the Marine Corps and you've and you got to command like the Central Command and you've got to go out there and send young men and women off to do incredibly dangerous things. And, and many of them, unfortunately, don't come back the way they they left, so it's a tough, tough job. And I think we, while we, just have a second, let's give a round of applause to the general mm -hmm. uh, for doing what he has done. Thanks, Will. Thank you. All right, now I've done a lot of research on what he's been saying uh, recently and in the last few years, so we're gonna press him, and then we're gonna open it up to your questions. So if you have a good question, think about it, uh, and we'll do it. Uh, uh, Iran right now, and I know you just came from a discussion on Iran. Uh, here's a question I have, because uh, I, I've been, I saw a quote that you had uh, the other day uh, in USA Today. Absent Iran's help, you said, I don't believe President Bashar al-Assad would have been in power the last six months. And I'd like you to explain uh, how Iran is keeping Bashar al-Assad in power in Syria. Well, I think, Wolf, you have to look at what happened in Syria and what developed there. Peaceful demonstrations, Assad's thugs start shooting on them. Uh, after Russia's regrettable veto in the United Nations, it's like Assad gets a second wind. But absent the Quds force, specifically a general named Soleimani, and his support, and the support, let me be very specific, weapons, ordnance, ammunition, leadership, fighters, money, absent that orchestrated support under a rather murderous brigadier named Hamadani, I think Assad would have found himself simply overrun by the, the gathering momentum against him. As it is, uh, he has been able to recently turn around with some tactical successes, 
in Western Syria, uh, thanks to the Iranian support and the Lebanese Hezbollah support. Lebanese Hezbollah acting very much in concert with the orders out of Tehran. And now they're achieving actually some operational successes there that we didn't see six months ago. We spent 10 years, the United States, mm -hmm. fighting in Iraq to create some sort of democratic, mm -hmm. stable regime. Right. The Iranians are transporting a lot of equipment to Syria, flying over Iraqi mm -hmm. airspace. Uh, was that the way it was supposed to be when uh, we, we, we devoted so much blood and treasure mm -hmm. to trying to create a, a new Iraq? Well, of course not, uh, Wolf, but the world history has its own momentum. Uh, you've got a country, Iraq, that shares a border, that shares a religion, that shares economic uh, uh, conditions with uh, Iran, and you put all that together and there's going to be some kind of relationship between Iraq and Iran. Now, when we pulled out, we certainly didn't expect to see the airways used as a way for Iran to directly resupply Assad. But, uh, and I would say that Iraq has not done enough to interrupt that resupply it's effort. Not, it's not just the flyovers. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Iraqis, the Shiite-led government of Nouri mm -hmm. al-Maliki in Baghdad right. is doing a lot more than just that to help Iran uh, in Syria. Well, I'm not sure how much more they're doing. I think there's a fear that if Assad goes, then Al-Anbar province with its Sunnis could become a problem if a Sunni-dominated Syrian government comes into play. So what we're watching is Maliki's centralization of power in the executive branch, which is allowing him to do some of this, something that with the Sunnis and the Kurds trying to work together to offset him in the, in the government, and certainly the latest elections put Maliki on the back foot. His party lost last week some of their provincial strength. We're going to see some political give and take, I think, here. We, but you're we're right. seeing a lot of bloodshed in Iraq right now. We don't pay we a whole lot of attention to it you're right. because U.S. troops are out. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they're, they're killing each other like crazy with these well, terrorist bombings. The, today, again, more than a dozen killed, several dozens wounded. This is primarily al-Qaeda trying to reincite the sectarian warfare, uh, the ethnic violence. Uh, they have not succeeded so far imperfectly Iraq is trying to settle its issues through politics. It's imperfect, but it is interesting as we watch the Arab Spring break out and the massive demonstrations in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Yemen. But did you notice in Iraq, there weren't massive demonstrations? Could it be that they believe that they actually have some say-so in their government? In other words, imperfectly, they are still trying to settle issues inside using politics. Now, the Iran and Syria issue is a serious one. We've, we've demarched them about this, and we still think they're not doing enough to stop supporting that Iranian uh, resupply. Because I'm, I'm, you, you served in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you fought there. You know right. the sacrifices that Americans made mm -hmm. uh, in, starting in 2003, and you know how, how much money yeah. we spent and hundreds of billions of dollars mm -hmm. to create an Iraq. With, and the question is this, and I'm, then I want to get back to Syria. Mm -hmm. The question is this, knowing what you know now, the relationship between the government in Iraq mm -hmm. and the Iranians, was it worth it? Well, I, history is going to have to tell on but, that. But you served there, General. Right, I have. So you, you have some thoughts about whether or not the men and women who fought there and the American taxpayers who paid for it, mm -hmm. was that war, knowing what we know now, worth it? If Iraq sitting at the geostrategic center of the Middle East continues to mature in a democratic way, then I would say yes. Now, there's a big if, and That's I realize that. If, yeah. However, I think if you ask the troops coming home from World War II, uh, we went to free Europe, you know, the ones who fought in Europe, uh, did you really intend in 1948 to see half of Europe enslaved by the Soviet Union? They said, that's not what I fought for. History, when you deal with warfare, you're dealing with a fundamentally unpredictable phenomenon. It's all the more important to get your goals straight at the outset so you know what you want to do. And the, we, I think, gave the Iraqi people a chance, and they appear to be imperfectly so far still working that chance forward for democracy. We wanted to keep a few U.S. troops there, uh, but the Iraqis would not give immunity to U.S. Mm. 
military personnel who remained behind. As a result, everybody yeah. left. Uh, who's to blame for that? Well, these negotiations are very difficult. Because you were in the midst of those negotiations. I was, yes. They, they are difficult negotiations. I believe that what we were doing there was trying to come to an agreement, but the way in which we had conducted our efforts in Iraq had made it very difficult for Maliki to acquiesce to the, uh, the sovereignty issue over the troops. Uh, I don't think that it was any one person to blame. These are what happens in the give and take of, uh, of international diplomacy. It's just, it's just it just didn't work out. Now, what could it have worked out? It would have taken both sides. It takes two to tango. And yes, it could have worked out. But the fact is, right now, we have not seen all the, the uh, disasters that have been portrayed in the press of what was going to happen when we pulled out. It and, still hasn't happened. And we're going to talk about Afghanistan, because we're in the mm -hmm. midst of similar negotiations yeah. with the government in Kabul right now. But let's get back to Syria mm -hmm. uh, for a moment. You're now retired. You're free to speak out and say whatever you want. And, uh, and, I, know you, and I know you will. Uh, uh, you're uh, fully capable of giving us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So what, if anything, should the United States be doing to get rid of Bashar al-Assad, assuming that's mm -hmm. what the U.S. wants? Yeah, well, uh, frankly, uh, Ms. Harmon, too, I've always kind of spoken my own mind. In fact, I, I've done it enough that uh, it's a privilege to be invited here because it's a privilege to be invited in front of any polite company anymore after some of the things I've said. Uh, Unfortunately, my mother uh, knows, 91 years old, knows how to use a computer. And for you young men, make certain what you say, your mother is not going to chew you out for it. Because even as a four-star general, it doesn't rate well with your mom. Um, on Syria, uh, I would just tell you on Syria, Wolf, ladies and gentlemen, that we are going to have to determine what is the end state we want. This war needs to be ended as rapidly as possible. That's the bottom line. But if the Americans go in, if the Americans take leadership, if the Americans take ownership of this, it's going to be a full-throated, very, very serious war. And anyone who says this is going to be easy, that we can do a no-fly zone and it'll be cheap, I would discount that at the outset. That's what Senator McCain says. Well, I, and I'm not pointing it at any one person. I, I'm not. Uh, he says that the U.S. should engage, even without a U.N. Security Council resolution, a no-fly zone over Syria. We need some sort of international imprint, whether it's Arab League or GCC. We need the region to provide some sort of framework within which we would operate. Then we need to be very clear about our military end state contributing to what political end state. Otherwise, you're allowed to invade a country, pull down a statue, and then say, now what do we do? You know what I mean? Let, 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 <laughs> we've been there. We've done it. Yeah. If the U.S. were to begin what Senator McCain and others want, mm -hmm. a no-fly zone, meaning the Syrian Air Force mm -hmm. couldn't fly, helicopters couldn't fly, jets couldn't fly anything, over Syrian airspace, as the U.S. and others did in Libya, for example, mm -hmm. uh, it would be a lot more difficult. In Syria, they have a much better air defense system than the Libyans had. Mm -hmm. Now, this is we're not even, you know, these right. aren't apples. This is a huge, yep. uh, so presumably, the U.S. would first have to knock out all of the Syrian air defense systems. Is that right? That's correct. But let's fall back to the political end state. Why do you want to take out their air support? Is it because they're using aircraft to kill most of the people on the ground? No, they're not. They're using artillery, machine guns, and mortars, and snipers. So let's have a reason for what we're going to do. And believe me, ladies and gentlemen, I've been up on the border in Jordan where the magnificent Jordan Armed Forces are compassionately doing what they can for these refugees. I've seen refugees in Africa and Asia. I've seen them in the Dalmatian coast. Uh, I have never seen refugees as traumatized as I've seen there. We all want to do something to stop this. But the desire to do something, the intention to do good, does not take the place of pragmatic what is possible. It, we have no moral obligation to do the impossible and hawk our children's future because we think we just have to do something. In order to do it, a no-fly zone, you'd have to say that's going to have an effect that you, the American people, want. So who is making the argument to you that this is what we need you to sign up for? 
Next, we have to show it's going to be militarily possible. I guarantee you, if ordered to do it, CENTCOM can do a no-fly zone. Guarantee you. It'll be very expensive. It'll have tankers. It'll have fighter planes up constantly. It will drain the treasury. It will take our hard-pressed military into one more fray. It's going to require helicopters and special forces to recover the pilots who get shot down. And can we do it? We're not a life insurance corporation. If the commander in chief says go, we go. Can we do it? Absolutely. And the killing will go on on the ground because they're not using aircraft to do most of the killing already. Yeah, I don't think this administration, this president, is going to order any, anything along those lines. Yeah. Uh, after Iraq and Afghanistan, I think the American public is pretty weary of wars mm -hmm. right now as well. But what about uh, arming the so-called good guys in this battle? Uh, there are a lot of opposition to Bashar al-Assad, uh, but some of those guys uh, are, not, are not necessarily friendly to the United States. No. They're al-Qaeda supporters uh, and worse. So uh, how do you know if the U.S. is going to supply weapons mm -hmm. to the Iraqi opposition? How do you guarantee that these weapons won't wind up in the hands of al-Qaeda? Well, guaranteeing it, uh, Wolf, will be very difficult. So there's first, no guarantee. But first of all, you can, you can get to a reasonable level of, uh, of assurance, I think, by using the secret services from the surrounding countries that are friendly to us to vet the people coming in. Then you do training, and I don't mean five days of kind of ma wave a magic wand. I'm talking weeks of training, individual and small unit, that's both technical and tactical, but more importantly, it's ethical. And then to some degree, I think whether it be civilian, uh, CIA paramilitary officers, or U.S. Special Forces, someone to accompany them at some level and make, just keep an eye on what they're using the weapons and training for. And I think there's a way to do it, but again, it's a commitment, it's not a donation. This is significant for a country that is once more going to find itself at odds with, uh, in the midst of a very, very confusing situation on the ground in the Middle East. Given the risks, is it smart for the U.S. to provide weapons to the Iraqi opposition? Syrian opposition. I mean, excuse me, to the Syrian opposition. Right. Uh, I think that... Uh, that would be something I'd have to defer to the people who are more current than I am. It's a very dynamic situation, but I think that if it's done properly and it's done with a sense, ladies and gentlemen, of full effort, not of modest effort, not of we're going to just go so far, not of troop caps. If we're going to do it, let's not go halfway because once we start this, then the American's standard is on the line and we don't need to demonstrate impotence or a long we could just increase the savagery if we don't do it right. More weapons, uh, increase the savagery, but not do well enough to end the war. We need to end this fight as soon as possible. Is it, so that's the direction it, I would well, take. Well, and I think you underscore a point that is worth making. And, and I've been you know, covering the military for a long time, going mm -hmm. back to the first right. Gulf War when I was CNN's Pentagon correspondent. Uh, isn't it true? Well, I'll ask you the question. Is it true that when it comes to military engagement, potentially like in Syria, mm -hmm. the U.S. military is much more reluctant to do it than some of the political uh, and civilian leadership. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, it, it depends. Uh, what a crummy answer. But ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> if we get a clearly defined political end state, and then we do our study and, and we, we determine what military actions will contribute and then we lay out, here's what we need to do it, then we would be willing to go in to do it. Well, but the military not, not, will always salute and, and obey. We but will. the question is, the, in the debates that go on, mm -hmm. in the discussions, you guys and, and the, yeah. the fighting men and women of the U.S. military, you have to worry about sending young people into harm's mm -hmm. way, and you're always worried about what could happen, worst case scenarios, whereas yeah. some of the political uh, types they don't necessarily focus in on that. Well, there's a fondness and appreciation and respect that you develop from, I mean, I, I grew up for 40 years in the Marine Infantry. Infantry is called infantry because infant soldier, young soldier, and I've signed over 1,600 next to kin letters. So yes, we're, we're reluctant to do so, but we also know some things are worth fighting for. And if you and your elected leaders tell us to go, I assure you the U.S. military will stand obedient and they will give 100% again. The military is not worn out. It's not tired. It's not frayed. 
our, fr our families are very brittle, and that should be understood. But the U.S. military is quite capable of giving our enemies their longest day and their worst day if ordered to do so. But we cannot fight wars, we should not fight wars without a clearly defined end state that has gone in front of all of you and you nod and say as bad as war is, that's what I want our sons and daughters to do. And secondly, these are the first wars we have fought in our nation's history with no reserve. In other words, in Iraq and Afghanistan, we have gone into these fights and because of troop caps, we have committed everyone. Now, what does that mean to you? Why did George Washington have reserves? Why did General Grant have reserves? Why did Douglas MacArthur have reserves? Because if something goes wrong, you have a way to avert a problem. If you see an opportunity, you have a way to exploit. We have not fought these wars with any reserves as we do calculations one by one of how many troops to put into a fight. Let me give you an example. We talked a lot about a surge into Afghanistan. Anyone know how many policemen there are in New York City? Around 40,000, I think, approximately. The surge was 30,000 into a country the size of Texas. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the greatest nation on earth. And when you go to war, it can't be a half step. It's a terrible step. Don't ever take it if you can avoid it. Negotiate, talk, diplomacy, whatever. But if you go, it should be compelling from day one. But that 30,000 came in on top of the what? 100,000 that were, if you add yeah. all the NATO troops, most of whom were mm -hmm. U.S., that were already there. In Afghanistan, we have the largest wartime coalition in modern history, 50 nations. But at the same time, you, you have to have a very certain trumpet. Think of the cavalry charging across the, the desert plains out here, out to the west a little bit, and think of the trumpet blowing retreat. You, you can't have that. You know, you're just going to confuse people. So you've got to be very clear that we didn't want a war, and here's why we're going, and then you do whatever is necessary, whatever that is. It's the Colin Powell doctrine, which you believe in, right? Very much okay. so. You fought in the first Gulf War? I did. Or were you still in elementary school then? <laughs> yeah. No, well. Yeah, he remembers. I know exactly how old you are, and I know how old I am, too. Okay. And just to give you some perspective, I have a 91-year-old mother as well. So. Yeah. Uh, but she's not watching on, she's on the streaming at, right. uh, uh, on the computer. All right, let's uh, wrap up Syria, because I want to move on. I got other yeah. subjects. Uh, a year from now, will Bashar al-Assad still be in power? <laughs> it depends. Does <laughs> right now, Bashar al-Assad has more reliable, committed allies than the opposition. And when you get into a brawl, the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them or fighting with allies who are not fully committed. Bashar Assad has got the full support out of Tehran and out of, Deme and out of uh, Lebanese Hezbollah. So and he's got a lot of Iraqi Shiites supporting him too, militias. Uh, uh, he does. They, they have also rallied to his cause. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of other people coming on the side of the opposition should they choose to do so. But so far, it has not been as strong a support. If, so that's what will determine. If Bashar al-Assad were to be removed, mm -hmm. and the opposition, the good guys in the opposition, as opposed to the al-Nusra, the bad guys, uh, were to take over, what would that mean for Iran and for Hezbollah in Lebanon? For Iran, when Assad falls, it'll be their biggest strategic setback in 25 years. It will set them back from their Mediterranean front. It will give the impression uh, to the Lebanese people who, after the Cedar Revolution, watched it robbed from them by Tehran and Lebanese Hezbollah and Syria. It'll give the impression that their, their uh, political uh, folks can run for office without fear of being killed. Lebanese Hezbollah will be somewhat defanged. I say somewhat because they're still a pretty murderous outfit. Uh, but it'll be the biggest setback for Iran uh, since the revolution. Do you accept this notion that the newly elected president the, new, uh, the, the guy who's replacing Ahmadinejad, mm -hmm. is a moderate? I don't believe he's a moderate, but that would not moderate my support for engaging with him and exhausting all alternatives uh, at this point. In other words, check and see if he can find some maneuver space. I don't think he's going to get much in the Tehran political climate where he might be able to walk the nuclear weapons program back. And it is a nuclear weapons program whether they say it is or not. They are, they are uh, enriching uranium beyond any peaceful purpose. So try it, talk with him, have very modest expectations, but at least try. 
How close is Iran to a nuclear weapon? I'd say one year. One year? One year if they chose to. But they, I don't believe they've made the supreme leader who will make the decision. I don't believe he's made the decision. Uh, if he does, I'm not completely confident that we would know immediately. We might know soon, but I don't think we'd know right, right away. Do you think the Israelis would actually launch an airstrike to try to deal with that? I have no doubt they would. Would the U.S. help Israel in an uh, operation no. like that? That one I don't want to speculate on. Uh, I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, we make our own decisions. We aren't in lockstep with another country, even one that we're as committed to the survival of as we are of Israel. But uh, I think, you know, it'd be a decision for the president, and whether or not he would know in advance, I think is at least questionable. So I, 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 you can't expect the, the impossible. Thing. I've heard that uh, the Israelis could do some damage, but they couldn't destroy it. The U.S. Mm. has the capability of destroying it. Well, I, I don't think anyone can destroy a program that is spread out from Tehran to the mountains, from underground facilities to above ground, and much of it is destroying access uh, to underground facilities with a good backhoe. You can open that back up. So I, I believe that what the important factor is, is whether Israel were to strike or the U.S. were to strike, if that was the commander in chief's decision, is how long is the delay? More importantly, what do we do with the delay? The delay is not the, certainly it can be delayed. You know, a month, six months, 18 months. What do you do with the delay is the question. I mean, then, and therein is where diplomacy and, and all the elements of statecraft have to come in. What I'm saying is the military can buy our diplomats some time, but it cannot solve this problem straight up. When you were the commander of the Central Command, mm -hmm. how much time, worry, concern did you have on Iran? Was that your primary mm -hmm. concern? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't have worry or stress. I cause worry and stress, you know. <laughs> um, He's a Marine. He's a Marine. Hey. I, I had 2,000, 200,000 wonderful of your sons and daughters, your soldiers, sailors, airmen, coast guardsmen, marines, plus unbelievably committed uh, allies. And I would just tell you that uh, that was, I went to sleep and slept very well the few hours I got uh, knowing they were on duty. However, uh, the first three things I uh, asked my briefers about when I woke every morning were Iran, Iran, and Iran. But that was your jurisdiction. The Central Command does all of the Middle East, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of North Africa, uh, and so yeah. it's a huge, huge responsibility. I want to move on from Iran because we've got a lot of, lot of other issues to get through, and I, I know there's questions that our distinguished mm -hmm. audience is thinking of. You know, those of us who are from Washington, a lot of Washingtonians here, there's a nice restaurant in Georgetown called Cafe Milano. Have you ever had dinner there? I have. It's a very nice restaurant. Now, a lot of us know the Saudi ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Adel al Jaber. Uh, I went to Saudi Arabia with him in 2002. He took me to uh, the Prince Sultan Air Base where we had 5,000 U.S. airmen getting ready to start the war against uh, Saddam Hussein. So I go way back with him. Did the Iranians want to blow up Cafe Milano and kill the Saudi ambassador to the United States? Absolutely. That was their plan. And absent one fundamental mistake, they would have done it. Why would they want to kill uh, this? I mean, they hate the Israelis, I could understand. But why would they want to kill Adel El Jaber, a graduate of Georgetown University? Adel is, was always one of my best advisors. He's a great ambassador. He is uh, unapologetic about supporting the Palestinian cause. He's not some stooge of America. Why did Iran want to kill him? Uh, Iran has killed the uh, Saudi diplomat in Karachi. They murdered the uh, assistant military attache in Sana'a. They are out to kill diplomats and people from Saudi Arabia and from Israel. That's the target of Lebanese Hezbollah that's murdered the Israeli terrorists or tourists up in uh, Bulgaria and all. So they have got this, this thing about Saudi Arabia and their, uh, their religious credentials and the fact that they this is this 1,400-year-old Sunni-Shia uh, schism that is coming back in violently. Where it waxes and wanes in terms of violence. It's on the waxing. It's increasing right now. And they see Saudi Arabia as an enemy. Now, for those of you who don't study this, it seems kind of strange. But believe me, they think of them as dirty Arabs and Sunni who look down their nose at Shia. 
so they actually set out to do it. It was not a rogue agent off on his own. This decision was taken at the very highest levels in Tehran. And again, absent one mistake, they would have murdered Adel and Americans at that restaurant a couple miles from the White House. And frankly, I'm not sure why, again, uh, they haven't been held to account. For example, we've been done a lot of talking here about how we're going after Al Qaeda, we're taking out their leadership, it's, it's franchising a little bit, but we're making some success. But there's two breeds of terrorism up against us. One is the Sunni Al Qaeda, as we call them. The other is the one coming out of Iran, the Gum School, and that is Lebanese Hezbollah and the ones you've heard of like that, who, by the way, declared war on us 10 years before Al Qaeda took out the French paratrooper and the U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut, uh, tried to kill Adel, uh, and this sort of thing. They have been basically not held to account. And when we finally caught them in the act of trying to kill Adel, we had a beleaguered attorney general, fine man, but beleaguered politically, stand up and give a, a legal argument that frankly I couldn't understand. And so I went back and found out more from our intelligence agencies and we had what I would call a Zimmerman telegram moment, going back to World War I, when we caught the Germans trying to work with Mexico against us. We caught them in the act, and yet we, get, we let them walk free. I think we've got to be very careful of avoiding confrontation with Iran, because right now, with their cyber effort, they're like children balancing light bulbs full of nitroglycerin. You get the picture? One of these days, they're going to drop one, and it's going to knock out the London Stock Exchange or Wall Street, because we never drew a line and said, you won't do it. Now, it's very important we stand up as Americans, say, this is what I stand for. It's also very important once in a while we say, this is what we absolutely will not tolerate. And I don't know why uh, Ottles, uh, the attempt on Ottle wasn't dealt with more strongly. Yeah, that's a good question. What was the one mistake they made? I think going to uh, the drug cartel had a DEA agent as part of it, you know, memo to themselves, don't do that no more, you know? Yeah. They got caught in the act, you know? <laughs> Because they tried to come in uh, from right. Mexico. Uh, let's talk about Egypt uh, for a moment. Uh, I was there in January. I met mm -hmm. with uh, then President <clears throat> Mohamed Morsi, and he gave me a lot of time in his presidential palace over there. Uh, he seemed to say a lot of the things that I would want to hear, right. Americans would want to hear. But uh, obviously, uh, Egypt, he became a hated man yeah. in Egypt. So you've been quoted as saying, and I'll, I'll give you the quote, you tell me what you mean by this. How it goes in Egypt will dictate the rest of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So explain. Egypt is, a, is the center of philosophy, of education, uh, traditional Sunni, moderate Sunni thought. It, it is, uh, what, it's got I think a third of the entire Arab population lives in Egypt. So how Egypt goes for traditional reasons, for current reasons, is going to be very, very important to the Arab Spring. But what happened was Morsi, you know, we've got a people there who are not very patient with imperious leadership, with leaders who don't become inclusive. They've already seen that, that movie once before. And what we saw was basically a popular impeachment with the largest crowds in modern world history out on the streets saying, down with this guy. And then you see the military muscle come in supporting the popular impeachment, and Morsi's out. But the Muslim Brotherhood made their own problems, I think, in this case. Was it a coup? I, I think it was military muscle that was saddled on board this, this engine of the popular uprising. Because if, if it's called a coup, then legal, legally the U.S. may have to reconsider a billion and a half dollars right. a year in military aid to Egypt. Well, it goes to another day, but I, I think we have to be very careful about passing laws with certain words when the reality of the world may not allow you the flexibility that presidents from Abraham Lincoln to FDR had to try to do what is in our legitimate best interest. And when we start putting ourselves into legal boxes where we can't act in our own best interest, our own legitimate interests, we're not doing the right thing for the next generation of kids that we want to say, we turned over this experiment we call America in as good a shape or better than we got it. We can eventually lose common sense on this, but I would just call it, uh, I mean, it's a setback for democracy, ladies and gentlemen, whatever you call it. And so the faster they can get back on provincial and presidential elections following a, a new constitution that the people embrace, unlike the last one that was rejected immediately by over 60% of the people, 
then Egypt will be back on the track to influence the rest of the region. But I guess you're encouraged, though, that this new leadership, the temporary leadership until there are new elections, whenever that happens in Egypt, mm -hmm. includes mostly well-known secular leaders, Mohamed el right, the Nobel Pro Peace Prize winner mm -hmm. who ran the International Atomic Energy Agency, well-known to uh, all of us, Nabil Fahmy, who was the, for a long time, Egypt's ambassador in Washington, right. uh, and now he's going to be the foreign minister of Egypt. Uh, these are people the West knows, the United States knows, uh, and uh, I assume from the U.S. perspective, the U.S. is a lot happier with these guys in power than Mohamed uh, uh, Morsi. I have the freedom of speaking for I instead of we now. I believe that what they have done is they brought in competent people, not just pious people, and these competent people can get some, some financial investment going in Egypt. Uh, they can, you know, just by seeing the inclusiveness of this, they'll stop this divisiveness the Muslim Brotherhood was fomenting. Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's notion that it's been decimated and that yeah. it's, it's over for Al-Qaeda. I assume you don't necessarily agree with that. You see a resurgence of Al-Qaeda, but correct me if I'm wrong. Not a resurgence, Wolf, but here's the point I would make. Uh, we've removed a lot of Al-Qaeda senior leadership. They are gravely injured, and we made it very clear we were going to go after them, follow them to the ends of the earth, and we have done, we have lived up to that. The challenge is that it's franchising and it's not exactly the same thing in North Africa as it is in East, uh, the Horn of Africa as it is in Yemen, but we should not declare victory early. You're out here in the Western Mountains. Some of the worst wildfires we ever had were where the fire was 80% controlled, and we pulled a lot of fire crews off the line, and they broke back out. I would deal with this almost like a wildfire or a disease contagion and make certain you continue to inoculate, you continue to eradicate, and keep on it and don't declare victory early. Because I've always felt that this war on terrorism is sort of like the war on drugs or the war on crime. It's never gonna, it's never, there's never gonna be an end point. The best analogy I can give you was right around here in West, 1850 to 1905, uh, when the U.S. Cavalry and the American Indians were engaged in constant skirmishing. Uh, I'd love to look down at, especially the younger people in the audience, say this war is going to be over. But the skirmishing will go on for a generation, probably, as we work on root causes, as we get education and economic initiatives, hopefully the time bought by our military and our CIA and our many, many allies. And just a word about allies. United Arab Emirates, many people just think of the Middle East as one big uh, region that's all the same. And Wolf was breaking it down piece by piece here. United Arab Emirates was with us when, when Wolf and I were over there in 1991 in Desert Storm. They were with us then in Somalia. They've been with us in Bosnia. They were with us in Kosovo. They were with us in Libya. And they're with us now in Afghanistan. In fact, as some allies started drawing down in Afghanistan, they increased their people fighting alongside us. So understand there are people in this region that have bet everything on sticking with the United States. So as you look at these kind of situations, remember, you're not alone. We've got a lot of people with us. But they, they, if you speak to people, leaders in the UAE, which, which is Dubai and Abu mm -hmm. Dhabi, uh, they're deeply disappointed uh, the way the US treated Mubarak in yeah. Egypt. <clears throat> they thought that was a strategic blunder. They're deeply disappointed in this wishy-washy that they see a wishy-washy mm -hmm. US policy in other parts of the region. Uh, and, and they're not very confident in U.S. leadership right now, but correct me if I'm wrong. The single biggest question I was dealing with in my last year was the perceived lack of U.S. reliability as an ally. Uh, we were able to overcome that, often uh, working specific issues with them, that sort of thing, but it was something we have to work on. It's just a reality. Uh, but I would also, uh, I would, well, let me just leave it at that. I mean, it, it, it's a challenge, but it's not to the point that they are willing to give up on the relationship with us. But we're going to have to demonstrate reliability because trust is what it's all built on. That's the coin of the realm. And if you can't maintain trust, then your leadership is obsolete, whether you're a military man, a diplomatic leader, whatever. And, and it's interesting to note, we'll move on, that uh, with the removal of Morsi, the UAE, Kuwait, 
the Saudis, they came up with about a $10 billion aid package to the new government in Egypt, uh, which is going to obviously be very significant. More than that, actually. Uh, much more than that, which obviously moderates the influence of our $1.5 billion aid package to the Egyptian military that helps keep the peace over there. But, but one, I think what you have to look at here, we've talked about Iran, we've talked about Egypt. The fundamental question is, are American interests served by political Islam as practiced by the Muslim Brotherhood or the regime in Tehran? And I think the answer to that is no. So what is our strategy, what is our policy to support the millions of people with democratic impulses in a part of the world where they don't have a middle class, they don't have democratic philosophies, they don't have a history, they don't have political, mature political parties. I think that's where these two strains come together. When I was in Egypt in January, it was heartbreaking to see Cairo. Mm -hmm. And I've been going there, first yeah. time I went there uh, was in 1977, right after Anwar Sadat went to Jerusalem, uh, and then the Israelis and the Egyptians started their peace process. Uh, but no tourists, yeah. unemployment unbelievable, you go to a beautiful hotel and you stay there and you're basically the only guest yeah. in the, 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 the economy in Egypt is struggling. Maybe this, uh, what did you call it? You didn't call it a coup, this military whatever, uh, uh, is going to change that a little bit. But, you know, people want, tourists want to go see the pyramids. They want to go uh, see all of the uh, yeah. historic uh, history of Egypt, but they're afraid to go right now for, mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. All right, uh, one final question before we open it up to questions uh, from the audience. Secretary of State John Kerry uh, has worked really hard these past few months to begin, once again, Israeli-Palestinian peace talks. And this week, they're going to start talking directly in Washington. Uh, the, Israeli, uh, the Israelis are sending a team. The Palestinians are sending a team. He obviously deserves a lot of credit for, for what he's trying to do. Here's the question to you. Is this Israeli-Palestinian peace process going anywhere? Uh, Wolf, that'll depend on the protagonists, and do they want it as much as I think our valiant Secretary of State wants it and is doing everything possible. Uh, but I would tell you that the current situation is unsustainable. It's got to be effect, uh, directly addressed. We don't want to turn this over to our children, the th same thing that you and I have lived with our entire adult lives. We have got to find a way to make the two-state solution that Democrat and Republican administrations have supported. We've got to get there, and the chances for it, as the King of Jordan has pointed out, are starting to ebb because the settlements and where they're at are going to make it impossible to maintain the two-state option. For example, if I'm Jerusalem and I put 500 Jewish settlers out here somewhere to the east and there's 10,000 Arab settlers in here, if we draw the border to include them, either it ceases to be a Jewish state or you say the Arabs don't get to vote, apartheid. That didn't work too well the last time I saw that practiced in a country. So we've got to work on this with a sense of urgency. And I paid a military security price every day as the commander of CENTCOM because the Americans were seen as biased in support of Israel. And that moderates all the moderate Arabs who want to be with us because they can't come out publicly in support of people who don't show respect for the Arab Palestinians. So he is right on target with what he's doing. I just, I just hope the protagonists want peace and a two-state solution as much as he does. And let's hope he succeeds. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, please stand up, uh, give us your name, your hometown, whatever you want, and ask your question. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is Q and A. Not A and A. It's a Q and A. Okay. Uh, Jenks Sidar, Sidar Global Advisors, Washington, D.C. Uh, you mentioned about the failed political Islam in the region. Uh, what would be the alternative political ideology that would put the Middle East together? Because Turkey is another example that uh, proved to be a failure after uh, the protests in Turkey and people dissatisfaction with the current regime. So do you think uh, a fully democratic and secular Turkey would be a better, better model than the current one for the Middle East? Thank you. I, a great question. I think if you look at uh, the quote about Egypt earlier, that Egypt is a country that wants a democratic, a secular government and love its religion at the same time. Of all places, uh, three years ago, I wouldn't even have been able to bring this up, Yemen is imperfectly going toward 
a democratic government. I mean, who would have thought Yemen, uh, that what a hard luck little country down there facing massive water and immigration problems and all. And so there's a way to have uh, a democratic government and there's millions and millions of Arabs who want this. They know that's the way to get the government that they deserve, that they need. But it does not have to be one that's run by imperious, haughty, moralistic, kind of my way or the highway, uh, politically Islamic uh, leaders who put the religion first. And you take a look at Iran. They can't win the affection to their own people. They can't run an economy. They've infuriated the world. They have no strategic ally, regional, worldwide. I wouldn't count Venezuela when they had the little fat guy in charge as a strategic <laughs> ally, you know? So you see these failures, and the best thing you can do with something like the Muslim Brotherhood is say, you've been against this all this time, so it's all yours. Because in governing, you have to be for something. You can't just be against something that some people in other countries might learn from. You have to be for something. All right, we got a question here. We can wait for the microphone. Hold up. Down here. Here, just come on in front. General, you did, you did a good job of laying out some of the limitations of any kind of a limited or proxy intervention in Syria. Uh, one of the other limitations would be the ability of the Iranian government to simply escalate further its support for the Syrian regime. Is there some limit to the capability of the Iranians to do that, seeing as they don't have a, a land frontier anyway. Have you, has your staff looked at that? Uh, Iran has significant limitations on its power. Uh, their foreign reserves are not in good shape right now. Economically, uh, they're in trouble. Every barrel of, ga of oil that Iraq pumps now lessens Iran's influence on the global oil market. So economically, internally, economically, externally, there are limits. Plus, uh, they, the supreme leader is, sits on, I think, a shaky throne. It's why they stomped on the green movement so quickly. And I think that they would be very reluctant to commit fully to something that could cause more unrest in the streets of Tehran. So I think there are internal and external limitations on what they can do. And frankly, we can, uh, we can accelerate those limitations, at least externally. Go ahead. Hi, Mo Tarkin up from New York and Boston. You talk about Iran, Iraq, Syria, and then you mention Israel could go in to Iran and the United States. Where's the rest of the world in this? Why are we the only ones that fight and nobody else fights with us, yet we're the ones that are hated everywhere? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great question. Uh, one thing I always wanted to do when I was commander of Central Command <clears throat> was uh, there's a bridge going into Washington called the 14th Street Bridge on the freeway that goes in there. And I wanted to put the flags of 50 nations that are fighting alongside us in Afghanistan, for example, up on that bridge just to remind people we're not alone. Estonia, Canada, and I think it's the Netherlands have lost more boys per capita than the Americans have. So you don't hear that if you watch the American news it's because it's mostly focused on our interests. You know, the, the, you know, the kid down the street from our neighborhood who died. But there's a lot of them fighting alongside us. And I will tell you, from intelligence purposes, to fighting terrorists, to fighting, uh, to providing me bases for our troops over there and locations and support, there's enormous commitment. And that story does not get to you. And I think that's a tragedy. At the same time, the Middle East peace process and the lack of progress there that Secretary Kerry is doing so much for right now, that short stops a lot of support for us because they, all politics are local in Abu Dhabi and Riyadh, just like in Washington and Aspen. That's why you asked the question. And I would just tell you that they can't come out in support of us if we don't see some progress where Secretary Kerry is wisely focused like a laser beam right now. Let's take a question over here, this side. Yeah. Hold the on. Microphone we're, lady we're getting the, the microphone. toughest job yeah. here. Yeah, Bernie Cooney, a uh, former Air Force uh, veteran and presently a lawyer in the Washington area. Uh, is it too late in Syria, given the uh, 
uh, Russian involvement, and Russian, I understand Russians are putting in weapons mm -hmm. at a rather significant rate to support the regime. And uh, with, in other words, too late for us to do anything without uh, boots on the ground in Syria. Yeah. Well, first, thanks for your service, and we'll try and get you a rehab program on the lawyer thing lined up. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, it's never, it's never too late, but there are some very bleak outcomes that could be forecasted right now. As one Middle East leader put it to me, we could be creating our own next Fatah right there at the geostrategic center there of the Middle East. But I think you simply have to play the ball where it lies and try to come up with the best possible outcome. Again, we have no moral obligation to try to do the impossible, but we should try to do what is possible, and that should be done in league with a lot of other nations so we're not putting our boys in to another confusing situation and trying to sort it out on the ground and make certain that others are equally committed and there's got to be an explanation to the American people if we're going to do it so that it's a, what in the Marines were intellectuals, I'm sure you're aware, it's a totus porcus, whole hog effort because, <laughs> because if you don't do that, uh, Syria fighting a total war can defeat us fighting a, uh, a limited war. Because that's the nature of war. It's mostly a matter of hope in men's and women's chests. And if they hope that we won't really give it everything, uh, if they hope, like Ambassador Akani put yesterday, the Americans don't lose wars, they lose interest. If they think we'll lose interest because we take some casualties or something, then our, our military might is, is moderated by the lack of political will. But we can do it if ordered to. We, we have a question up front right here. Thank you, General, and thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. um, Steve Shapiro from New York. Not a geographical question. Yesterday we explored a little bit with Carter Ham sitting in that chair, mm -hmm. uh, all of the resources available to modern combat commands, and it's really quite extraordinary, and I think the average person doesn't realize how extensive they are mm -hmm. beyond guns and bullets. Um, could you just educate us a little bit about the role of combat commands in diplomacy? Sure. Yeah. Uh, all those capabilities we have are thanks to all of you and the money that's not going to your schools, the money's not going to your communities, that's coming over to us. So we keep this experiment that we call America alive. And I would just tell you that in terms of diplomacy, not a week went by, not a day went by when I didn't talk to one of the 20-odd ambassadors in my region. There were some of them, some of our, in the most, uh, difficult positions in Patterson, in Cairo, uh, our ambassador in Beirut, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Bahrain, where I would be talking to them several times a week. And my job was to find a way to put the U.S. military operations embedded within their portfolio and make certain that the countries out there never saw a glimmer of daylight between the U.S. military and our diplomacy. And there were many times when, because of our relations and who's in charge out there, I had relationships with the leadership where I could carry a message that was trusted and received very privately. I did it in a way that never made the newspapers. I never wrote a cable, so WikiLeaks never got me. <laughs> but, and then I would call the ambassador right back. But the ambassador is the president's representative there, and we were lock, stock, and barrel, dovetailed inside his or her uh, efforts, and we were unapologetic about it. I, I walked in once, and a guy beat me up. First time I'd been back in CENTCOM, I'd just been, I'd just about retired. I got within six days when I got sent to this job. And for the first 20 minutes, he lit into me about Iraq, about what happened in Iraq, or what we'd done. And finally, I raised my hand and said, you know, Mr. King, I surrender. I said, I don't write policy for my government. I will not say anything negative about my president. Uh, your soldiers don't write your policy either. I just carry out the last 600 meters of my president's policies, okay? And he sat back and looked at me and said, we're going to get along fine. And from then on, I could call him any time. He was over at my house in blue jeans for barbecue, and he was a great advisor warning me what was going on inside 
the discussion over there. That kind of information going back to our diplomats and our Assistant Secretary of State and our Deputy Secretary of State and to Secretary Clinton, I will just tell you it allowed us a, a synergy that would be otherwise lacking. And uh, I would just tell you in the midst of all this, as you all wonder how militaries work, just take a look at the military up in Syria, look at the military in Libya and what, they're do what they've done under Muammar Gaddafi and Assad then look at what the Egyptian military has done if you want to see a heroic, professional military, not perfect, but also take a look at the alternatives to what we have been working with all those decades. A lot of those Egyptian generals trained in the United yes, States. and we knew them. Yeah. yeah. All right, go ahead. Thank you. Dixon Osborne with Human Rights First. Uh, Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates made a very strong case that we needed to increase the foreign assistance budget. Yeah. Do you agree with them? And can you tell us, uh, did the lack of investment in foreign assistance impact your objectives? Uh, I'd be hard pressed to answer the second question with anything measurable, but let me put it this way. Uh, when I went up and I would call on the members of the Foreign Relations Committee's House and Senate, uh, and I would tell them, if you don't vote more money for the foreign relations budgets for, to help our ambassadors to reach out and make an impact, please vote more money for ammunition because I'm going to need it. That's about as bluntly as I can put it to you. That answer your question? Yes, it does. <laughs> go ahead. Let's go back there first and then we'll come up here. Thank you, Wolf. General Mattis, uh, I'm Dan Raviv with CBS in Washington. Uh, what assurance can you give us that all the magnificent efforts of, what, about a million Americans in uniform since 9-11 mm -hmm. have made this country safer, and please include the possibility that we've perhaps created more enemies because of our military action. Sure, uh, great question. And because of people like you in Washington, I'm now at Hoover in Stanford, uh, out with Stanford, <laughs> because it's as far as I could get from Washington and not get wet. Um, Look, you cannot, uh, some people say it's easier to defend America if you never set foot in Washington. Actually, I have great affection for those who, who daily uh, do what they do in that town, to include the U.S. Congress, by the way. I, I, that's another thing I'm unapologetic about. But l let me put it this way. Remember what you felt like on 9-12-2001? You remember? Yeah. You haven't felt that way since. Now, there was a tragedy in... in in Boston and there's been a guy try to light his underwear on fire or whatever, you know. So this is going to be a constant skirmish. But you cannot go and do what I would call an algebraic equation. U.S. troops in Iraq plus U.S. troops in Afghanistan plus U.S. efforts in Yemen minus what we didn't do here plus this equals peace in our time. It's not that way. Welcome to the real world. But at the same time, you vote people in Many of us study for years how best to do this, and we did our best. Uh, if you've got good ideas, come on in. I'm all ears. Uh, not anymore. Uh, <laughs> send you somewhere else. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we had young men and women look beyond the, uh, the rancorous, uh, the hot political rhetoric, and volunteer and write a blank check payable to the United States people with their lives. And I think that that has sent a message to an enemy that times wondered, could we put up with the danger and discomfort? And I will guarantee you that the ferocity and the ethical performance of our troops, and that's what defines them as they close in on the enemy, sends a signal that free men and women can fight like the Dickens. And that's a message that answers your question. We can probably take another one. We'll okay, we'll, we'll take, uh, how much more time do we have? One more from the uh, audience, then one more from me, and then you can go have dinner. Go ahead. Is there a woman who would like to ask a question? Yes. All right. You know what? We have two women, so we'll have two more questions from the audience. There we go. Sir Laurie Sutton, uh, old soldier here. Uh, thanks for your service. Quick mm -hmm. question. You mentioned that our, our troops are good to go, mm -hmm. but their families are brittle. Mm -hmm. What do we need to do to make our families fully mission capable? You know, Lori, this is just the cost of keeping this experiment alive. And if you go back to the, the families that waited for their boys to come marching home, south or north in the Civil War, 
or from over there in World War I. This is just the cost of keeping this experiment alive. Now, there are certainly programs you can do, and there's, there's to tell you the truth, sometimes the, the spouse of the ladies back home of my Marine Infantry Division were better organized, I thought, than my division was, you know? <laughs> so there's a, but there's a sisterhood, there's a, there's a strength that comes, uh, just like the sequoia trees that grow their roots together so they can take a hell of a wind, you know? And they did it, and they're doing it now. They need to be thanked. Don't thank me for my service. I mean, don't thank us guys. We do this because we actually enjoy it. We enjoy, I'm on record about this, we enjoy putting on that uniform. And I was a Marine for 43 years, and it wasn't long enough. I, but the families need any support, any thanks. But most of all, just you all inviting them over to your neighbor party, neighborhood party, and just saying we're with you. I mean, that's worth more than any general officer's speech to them, I guarantee you. All right, we have the last question from here. Hi, Catherine Herridge. Uh, since you raised the issue of reliability, I'd like to get specific. What events have undermined the United States' reliability with its allies? Well, I think, uh, I think there's an impression that we weren't wholly committed. And you, you've got, when you go into a fight, I was reading some things about Ulysses Grant and why he did not go to war with Spain over Cuba. He said, I've been in a war. We're not going, we don't need to do this. But when you can make the argument to the American people that we're going to do something, then you've got to really do it. And there's no room for second place. And you don't win wars by being kind to the enemy. First thing I would tell you is never, there's a wise man up in New York City that was a great help to me. Anytime I was in trouble, I would call him. I'd, and after a moment's silence, after I bled all over the telephone in a Germanic accent with voice, he'd say, General, come to New York immediately. I've cleared my schedule. And I would go see him, and he would tell me, don't ever tell the adversary in advance what you're not going to do. And I would just leave it at that. Don't ever, just tell them, don't mess with us. We love the world. We don't want to fight, but we will fight if necessary. And it'll be your, what I call your worst day and your longest day. And for crying out loud, let's have generals and admirals quit sucking their thumb and talking about sequestration because, believe it or not, they keep talking about how we're getting weak. North Korea or Iran may start believing it. We're not weak. We, we've got to do something. We can't let this go on, and we've got to correct it soon. But don't tell the world you're weak and make darn certain you don't tell your adversary what you're not going to do in advance. Just take a look at Kosovo and how long it goes on until we move one army brigade towards the theater. So that, I just leave it at that. Thank you, Will. All right. Uh, this is the last question. It's just the personal, because uh, it was so irritating to learn this week, to me, someone who's uh, watched since 2003 the U.S. in, in Afghanistan, talking mm -hmm. about Afghanistan right now. Hamid Karzai, I interviewed him before he was the president of Afghanistan. And to see how this relationship has deteriorated between the U.S. and Afghanistan, uh, after all the blood and treasure, the sacrifice mm -hmm. that the U.S. made over these past many years, uh, and now the U.S. Is, still has 60,000 troops in Afghanistan as we speak yeah. right now. They're all supposed to be out at the end of next year unless there's, uh, they're going to keep some of them there. And that's still iffy. We'll see what happens. There is that so-called zero option that no U.S. troops stay in Afghanistan just as no U.S. troops mm -hmm. are in Iraq. But to learn this week, and you've probably known this, that as we start pulling out troops from Afghanistan, it's still another 18 months to go. It's still costing U.S. taxpayers at least a billion and a half dollars a week to maintain, maintain those troops in Afghanistan. A hundred billion dollars American taxpayers are going to be spending between mm -hmm. now and the end of next year. You know, you, you just think what a hundred billion yeah. dollars could do, uh, whether in education or uh, yeah. housing or whatever, uh, domestically, or just to reduce the federal mm -hmm. debt, if you will. But uh, all of a sudden, the Afghanis are now telling the U.S., uh, by the way, every container uh, truck that leaves Afghanistan, you're going to have to pay customs and fees. You want, you want to withdraw those tanks. You want to withdraw the hardware. I drive into Pakistan, get the ships. This is the cheapest way of doing it. Uh, right now, they want $70 million, but it could go up to a billion dollars that they're saying 
uh, they want. And, the, and this is, a lot of people see a, a shakedown mm -hmm. by, the, by the regime in Afghanistan. They want money, because a lot of this money, as you well know, and you served in Afghanistan, doesn't wind up in the hands of people. It winds up, a lot of rich people have emerged from all the money yeah. that U.S. taxpayers have spent in Afghanistan. And now they want to shake us down for customs fees for every truck that leaves carrying yeah. U.S. equipment. Is that, yeah. Does that make your blood boil? Look, I, I think this will be worked out. Uh, who knows where this issue came from and how mature how it was. How much is it going to cost American taxpayers, though, to withdraw, to remove equipment from Afghanistan in terms of customs, the contractors who are doing yeah. it? They, I, I want, they want to squeeze the United States for hundreds of millions of dollars well, I, after I, all the U.S. has done to, to get rid of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, and you're, you're right to be concerned about it. I would be, too, but I don't know that it's, that it's going to happen. First of all, these things come up, they make a big splash in the news, two weeks later something else is, and that issue has been shelved and never amounted to anything. It's a big issue right now. It, it's a very big issue right now. And like you, I've known President Karzai since before he was president. Uh, he is a tribal, local politician. He has to play to his local constituency as well and never show that he's somehow you know, uh, the stooge of the Americans. But he, he's been a problematic uh, leader, Let, let's face it. I mean, but if you go back to World War II, you'd think Eisenhower spent more time settling issues between the British, the French, the Americans than he did fighting Mr. Hitler, you know? It's the toughest thing in the world is fighting alongside allies. Now, I'm not in any way excusing this. I don't believe we'll pay one cent in customs coming out of there, not one penny. All right. uh, but at the same time, I'm speaking for I, not the U.S. government, and I'm not current. I'm a month and a half out, and believe me, things change fast in that part of the world. Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, thank you.